Okay, Susan, I think we're on Facebook Live now, and uh, it's almost 10 o'clock, so maybe we could um, just get started, and um, you would probably do a better introduction of yourself than I would, but uh, Susan Tamasebi, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for joining Code Pink in this half hour uh, webinar on what is happening inside Iran as well as U.S.-Iranian relations. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Susan Tamasevi. I'm an Iranian women's rights activist. I lived and worked in Iran from 1999 until 2010, supporting you know, civil society, working to build the civil society, and working as part of the women's movement. Um, in 2010, I came back to the US. Actually, I had migrated into the US at the time of the revolution and I went back to Iran in 1999. But in 2010, I came back to the US. And since then I've been working regionally in the Middle East and North Africa to support women's um, groups, women's movements across the region um, on you know, their demands for rights and peace. Um, right now I direct an organization called Femena which works in the Middle East and North Africa region. And a lot of our work is with civil society groups and women's groups in closed and repressive contexts. So places like, you know, um, Iran, Egypt, Turkey, et cetera, um, where women are working hard to make their voices heard through civil society organizations. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about um, what's going on in Iran and how it impacts women. So we'll spend most of our time talking about what's happening in Iran, but of course, as Donald Trump sucks up so much energy, I thought maybe we should at least talk about his, uh, first the, the uh, aggressive tweet in all caps uh, and followed up by a uh, response he gave to a journalist saying that he was ready to speak to the leaders of Iran and how this kind of back and forth craziness uh, is, uh, felt inside Iran and, and among the Iranian-American community as well. Sure. Of course, you know, we were very nervous last week when tensions sort of rose to their, possibly their highest level, at least in the last few years, um, when there were a number of sort of very aggressive and threatening tweets going back and forth, starting with the all caps tweets of President Trump, um, you know, telling Iranians that they can't threaten the U.S. and um, he was reacting to statements made by Rouhani, who had said, you know, war with Iran would be the mother of all wars. Peace with Iran would be the mother of all peace. And um, so I'm not sure how, you know, threatening that that was intended to be. Perhaps it was intended to um, by Rouhani to draw some lines against, you know, increasing U.S. threats um, that were a result of the U.S. pulling out of the JCPOA and deciding to implement sanctions. JCPOA against. meaning the... Uh, the yeah. The nuclear deal, exactly. But nevertheless, the tensions were high and there were a war of words you know, exchanged by both sides. And we were very nervous. We didn't know where these tweet, Twitter, where this Twitter war of words would lead. And then all of a sudden, you know, in an, in, in an inter interview in Italy, President Trump said that he's willing to speak to Iran with no preconditions if the Iranians are willing to come to the table, which was Rather strange because um, Secretary of State Pompeo had actually listed a 12 point plan um, after the US pulled out the, of the nuclear deal talking about um, uh, you know, the preconditions of the US for engaging in new negotiations with Iran, even though Iran had lived up to its, um, its side of the deal in terms of it, you know, nuclear inspections and um, uh, its requirements with respect to the nuclear deal, the U.S. had pulled out and they had in, you know, instituted a 12-point plan, which made it extremely difficult for Iran or any other sovereign nation really to come to the table because they were asking Iran to give up quite a bit. Um, um, so I, I don't really know how to read Trump's um, offer to speak uh, with Iranians or engage in negotiations with, with Iranians with no preconditions, because immediately after he sort of made the statement, which you know was news for two whole days, um, both in Iran and out, you know around the world, Pompeo again stipulated a few more requirements. Um, so 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Certainly, I think it's better than the tensions that we were seeing before that. We were, I think we were moving towards potential conflict, even if it wasn't necessarily intended. That level of verbal tension and threats could you know, lead to some sort of conflict. So I'm happy that we've maybe moved away from those very um, difficult times to a time where um, leaders of both countries could perhaps, you know, have a more civilized conversation about the path forward. And, um, I, I, and I hope that the offer for discussions and negotiations is a real and genuine offer. Um, I would think that um, President Trump and his administration would have to take some steps to um, uh, let the Iranians know that they are, they actually do want to engage in respectful and um, um, equal discussions with the Iranians, because it is the U.S. that pulled out of the nuclear deal. It wasn't the Iranians who pulled out of the nuclear deal. Um, well, yes, and uh, as you well know, um, sanctions is, is war by other means. And not only have there been, uh, since the time of the revolution, sanctions against Iran, uh, but the sanctions that were lifted when the nuclear deal was signed have been reimposed. And now coming up very soon on August 6th, there will be yet another round of sanctions. So uh, can you tell us a bit about how these sanctions affect people uh, inside Iran uh, and uh, how you feel this new round of sanctions will affect them even further? Well, the, the last round of sanctions were pretty, pretty serious. I mean, they, you know, the U.S. managed to get sort of the world community on board in terms of these, the sanctions the last round, and they impacted Iranians very negatively. But they were intended to bring Iran to the negotiating table. So we, we could say that perhaps they, 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 you know, even though they were very difficult for Iranians and impacted most ordinary Iranians, they had a, a very distinct goal. These sanctions that President Trump promises to implement um, don't have the same sort of poly policy, clear policy objectives, because we'd already meet, we'd already met the policy objectives of the sanctions. So, um, and Iran was obviously complying, but the stated, the stated. Um, intent of these new sanctions is by, you know, is by many people associated with the administration is to create chaos and um, uh, to basically destroy the Iranian economy and to in some way indirectly overthrow the regime um, uh, in Iran. Uh, while Pompeo in his speech in California talked that, you know, he officially said that um, they're not after regime change. A lot of the people closely associated with the Trump administration or have advocated for regime change for many years. And it seems that these particular economic sanctions are actually intended to sort of destroy Iranian society from within, which is already struggling in terms of its economy. So um, obviously sanctions, I think people who follow sanctions, I'm not a sanctions expert, but because, you know, my country has been sanctioned for 40 years, you sort of, you, it, it becomes an important issue for you. Um, people who follow sanctions, they, rec you know, they recognize that um, they have usually have the most impact on the most vulnerable groups of people, ordinary citizens, and they tend to strengthen the hands of hardliners. Um, the reaction to the, just the offer of Trump in Iran has actually been met at least from a couple of hardliners with a flat out no response and a sort of very threatening response. It's not the official reaction, but it shows that perhaps there are elements within the Iranian government or Iranian state, hardline elements that don't want normalization of relations, that don't want discussions, don't want the economic sanctions necessarily to be lifted or this threat of war to be lifted because they benefit from it. But what you have are you have ordinary people who don't benefit from it. Already the Iranian economy is in is suffering greatly because of the speculations, because of sanctions and increasing isolation of Iran. Um, and, you know, so the last time we had sanctions, we did, we talked to a lot of people um, and I'll talk about the impact it has on women. One of my colleagues did this great research and hopefully we'll be able to translate it and update it and make it available to people who are interested, but talking to women. And what they did, um, what she found in this research is that what happens to women when they suffer economically and a lot of the economic uh, setbacks that they suffered, they'd actually attributed to the sanctions last time around is that they cut from 
their first they cut from their leisure activities right then they cut from things like beauty supplies and it, things like that then they start actually cutting from their medicine then they start cutting from their food so a lot of the women that she that she um, interviewed had actually stopped um, eating vegetables, eating meat, eating dairy products so that they could feed their children. And they were suffering greatly because of the sanctions on a personal level. Um, some women had talked about, you know, how a few of the women that she talked to actually talked about how they'd taken on, how they'd been forced to do um, the kinds of work that they would never do otherwise in order to meet their economic um, needs. And so given the fact that Iranian economy is suffering so much, I think that this round of sanctions will have great impact, especially on women and other vulnerable groups at a much faster pace than the last round actually had, had negative impacts. So it's, um, uh, people have, have told me that it's hard to find some medicines in Iran and yet medicines are supposed to be exempt from the sanctions. So how does that happen? Well, there are a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll go back to what happened last time, and then I'll talk about what's happening now, because the sanctions haven't been fully implemented yet, or they haven't really been implemented yet. Um, so what happened last time, immediately in 2010, when they announced the sanctions, the shipping industry was sanctioned. So Iran couldn't get uh, insurance for its ships. It couldn't, because the insurance has to be bought, you know, and, you know, through. So basically, and no shipping was actually allowed to the country. So immediately, almost immediately, you could feel the absence of medicines in Iran because there was no shipping, there was nothing being shipped. Later on with the central bank was um, sanctioned. And this is, you know, these sanctions, san sanctioning the central bank is unprecedented. It had been unprecedented. It had never really happened except for perhaps very targeted for weapons, you know, weapons productions. But this is a blanket sanctioning of the central bank, which meant that Iran couldn't um, uh, ex couldn't pay for anything. So we couldn't use SWIFT. You couldn't pay for anything. So therefore, even if medicine is not um, uh, being sanctioned, is allowed, you know, as sale of medicine is allowable, that even that companies inside of Iran or the government couldn't actually buy and pay for medicine. A lot of pharmaceutical companies inside the country who make medicine couldn't get their, pri their uh, material because they import the material from outside. They couldn't get the material to, cre to make the medicines that they, that they needed. So this had a great impact in terms of medicine. And you know, towards the end of the sanctions period, people weren't getting medicine for uh, illnesses such as cancer. There wasn't even, um, at one point there was um, uh, um, anesthesia that was being imported from China who was, that was defective and people were dying for simple operations because they were having reactions to this bad medicine. So it was really terrible. Now what's happening is that in anticipation of sanctions, um, people who have uh, hard to find medicines aren't making them available for sale or others who have access and have money are buying them up ahead of time. So there's, you know, what's available on the market is not, um, is not, is not available to everybody, right? So people are hoarding it basically. And of course, the, you know, the, those who are producing medicine are going to have the same problems. Given the fact that the real has lost its value, it's uh, over 50% in the last few months, it's become very difficult for those who make medicine inside the country, importers to import the, the goods, you know, the uh, material to make the medicines inside the country. So already we're seeing some level of shortage, even before the sanctions kick in. And these protests, there were some in, uh, in December and January of uh, last year and beginning of this year, and then there have been sporadic protests. Uh, how much do you feel that they are uh, genuine uh, grassroots uprisings versus being fomented from the outside? And uh, how likely are these to grow to be significant threats to the government? I think, I mean, I think definitely the protests are genuine protests. I wouldn't say that um, certainly there's some fomenting, there's some encouraging, but I do think that, you know, it is a general dissatisfaction um, uh, sort of, uh, and, you know, in, in each area, I, I read a really good article that talked about how um, uh, really this is a, uh, a failure of governance, because in each area, the demands were different. So if you go, you know, some areas, it was for unemployment, some area was in terms of the environment or, 
you know, talking about corruption, etc. So I think that that you know that the um, the protests were genuine in that sense. Um, and they're, you know, people are demanding their government to be responsible to them, for them to meet its, its demands. Um, the fact, I can't deny, I'm sure that some of, some of the protests, protesters are being egged on, etc. But they're also being crushed as well. Um, so um, I think that, you know, I think that the Iranian government has a very, very difficult task in terms of meeting its um, addressing sort of its interna the international crisis, addressing regional issues, but then addressing the demands of its public. So it has, it has a huge, huge task um, ahead of itself. So there's uh, somebody who wrote in a question and asked about uh, how strong is the secular movement for democratic reforms in Saudi Iran? I mean, I, I, we have a long, long history of um, uh, sort of a movement for democracy inside the country. Um, we had a um, constitutional revolution in 1906. Um, so it's, you know, it's over a hundred years that we've been working it. And I think we've had, you know, so we had a secular movement and then we had a national movement and then we had an Islamic movement um, I think right now people are from within are working to create reform. The problem is that may, perhaps the reformists have lost um, the message with which to really um, uh, to gain the public um, support that they had. Uh, we can't forget that a year ago, a lot of people went to the polls to vote for Rouhani. Um, this last year has been extremely difficult on the Iranian public because Rouhani hasn't been able to deliver ec economically because those, those sanctions that were supposed to snap back, they haven't snapped back. There's a lot of mismanagement. There's also a lot of corruption that through use of um, social media is um, uh, sort of people are finding out about it and it creates a, lot, a lack of hope and um, a, a great frustration among the public. But I think that there is still a genuine civil, you know, there's still a genuine effort within the country to create reform and to work for democracy. There's a genuine civil society that has it very, very difficult. We don't hear the voices of civil society very much because they, inside the country, um, they face backlash when they speak up. Many of them face backlash when they speak up. Um, and so people outside speak on their behalf. One of the young men, Zia Nabavi, who was imprisoned for nine years, and then finally they told him, actually, you know, you, the imprisonment was wrong, but he'd already spent nine years in prison, was just arrested again yesterday, which was devastating for me to see. But today I read a piece of news that he was released, but he's one of these young people who, even though he was in prison for nine years, he does believe in reform um, and he does believe in making change from inside the country. And he, um, you know, is a very sort of moderate, has a very moderate vision. He thinks that change needs to happen slowly and deeply. Yeah. So um, could you talk a little bit about the, wh what you would call a women's movement in Iran? What gains have been made over these years? What are women still fighting for? And what kind of, uh, what ways do they use to struggle for more rights? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a very, I'll try to make it very condensed and quick because it's a long history, but at the time of the Iranian revolution, um, uh, the, the um, revolutionaries adopted a very conservative version of um, their interpretation of Sharia law. And we lost a few of the rights that we had gained, not very many, but we had struggled, women had struggled for them and we lost them such as, you know, uh, checks on polygamy, you know, uh, increase in age of marriage, uh, even abortion rights. So for, for, for the time, Iran was actually very progressive, even though we had still a lot of restrictive laws on the books. Um, so women lost a lot of their rights. They've been fighting for it ever since. The, the, conser the very conservative interpretation of Sharia law imposed uh, certain you know, requirements on women um, such as, you know, allowed for polygamy. Of course, polygamy was allowed before as well, but it reduced the age of marriage to nine years old. It's been increased to 13 since then, and now there's discussion for it to be increased to about 15 or 16. There's back and forth on that. Um, um, so women are fighting 
for their rights within their family. They're fighting for um, reform of some, uh, some um, uh, criminal law that impacts them negatively. They haven't made much headway in terms of actually changing the laws. They've had some small successes. Like I said, the increase in age of marriage and child custody, for example, um, issues like that. But women have actually gained quite a bit in terms of their, um, their social status. So if you compare women's legal status with their social status, it's, hu it's hugely different and divergent. So women are, you know, they're present in the workforce, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're even truck drivers, taxi drivers, right? Um, while the age of marriage is very low, the actual average age of marriage is 25 and 27. Um, the rate of divorce is very high, even though it's very difficult for women to get divorced, but they're still getting divorced. And the rate of education for women is very high. Women are educated, college graduates, you know, the majority of women, even though there's been attempts to sort of push women out of the workforce. During Ahmadinejad's period, there was a pushback on these social gains, but women have managed to hold their ground. Um, women are fighting, you know, the women's movement suffered a great setback after our 2009 protests. A lot of people left, the economy was really bad, sanctions made the economy worse, Iranian women became even more isolated, there was a sense of hopelessness, and there was repression and crackdown. But they're slowly exactly. rebuilding. Part of the Green Movement. Yes, after the Green Movement, after it was crushed. But they're slowly rebuilding their movement. And I'm actually very, very hopeful um, on March 8th, we saw sort of this, this very broad example of the different types of work that women are doing. And they held many, many events, which was, was very, for me, was very hopeful. They had a number of conferences and meetings. That's International Women's Day. Exactly, International Women's Day. We celebrate it. Um, we've been celebrating it for many years. It's a big deal inside of Iran. And, you know, beyond the conferences and the events that they held, they also had a number of street actions, women going out into the metro, women talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the economy, etc., the right to choose their, their veils, you know, what, the, how they dress. And also there was a protest planned inside of the, in front of the Ministry of um, Labor um, to object or to bring attention to women's economic situation. A lot of people were arrested. I think 80 people were arrested. Finally, 20 people were, were charged, but they were all acquitted last week, which, is, which was, to me, it was a very positive thing. It shows that at least some part of the security apparatus is, a, is for civil society being active and is, is, is willing to create that space. And I hope that the women's movement can use that space to continue building on the successes that it's had, the slow successes it's had in the last few years. And what we hear about in the United States are perhaps the more superficial or less uh, in-depth kind of struggles of women to not wear a headscarf or to be able to attend sports stadiums. How important are those issues? They're obviously, they're very important because they're important to women's daily lives. Women have been struggling against the um, official state uh, form of, you know, veiling and hijab from day one, really, they have been. They've never given in to the official um, uh, sort of government mandated form of hijab. So they've been struggling, struggling against that. And they're struggling for it even more, um, uh, more loudly these days. The stadium, of course, this is a movement that's been going on since the early 2000s. Um, and there seems to be some, finally, the government is finally giving into it um, a little bit more. So we do hear a lot about those, but there are also a lot of other activities that women's groups are engaged in that we don't necessarily hear about. And they include working on, you know, prevention of violence against women. Um, there's a group that's working, they, they came up with a draft uh, bill, a draft law that they, they you know, and the, the parliament is actually looking at a draft law on prevention of violence against women. So hopefully they'll be able to um, provide feedback and work with parliament to, to adopt a better, a, a good law, a better version of the law that, that's being presented. There's another group that's working to prevent street harassment. They just launched a um, harass watch website where people can go and report and they're working with a municipality of Tehran 
um, to post their inform informative posters in the in the metros and in taxis. There's another group that's working on prevention of harassment in the workplace. So they're working with factories. So there's a lot of different kinds of group work that's going on inside the country um, that we don't really hear about ever. Um, Sorry, I, Susan, when you say harassment on the street or in the workplace, is that verbal harassment or is there actually physical grabbing of women on the street? Well, the harassment on the street, yes, it's, it's verbal harassment. It could also be physical harassment, etc. Um, and, you know, this was always, always, so yes, so they're working to prevent this. They have some great posters that they've developed that really talks about, you know, how people should sit in the taxis, how they should sit in the metro, you know, catcalling isn't, you know, uh, a way to, you know, it, it, it's not flattering for women and it's actually threatening. So it's an educational and a preventative. And there's actually a law on the books. It's a pretty harsh law. We don't, ne I don't necessarily advocate for it against harassment. So it includes lashings. But um, uh, there was a recent court case that actually required a harasser to do community service, which we think that's good. We don't want we don't want people to be lashed for harassing. You might you might want it. We don't really want it in law. You might wish for it if you're going through harassment. It's, it's, uh, um, but we don't really want it in law. So that that is actually a big you know it's it was a big achievement that somebody was sentenced to do community service for you know harassing a woman. This is great. Um, the harassment in the workplace that we're talking about. So this is, there hasn't been a lot of work on this. There's no encompassing law that deals with this. So the people who are working on this issue started with blue collar workers and started working in factories. They've done a, a, a number of trainings and actually the factory workers and all the local officials they've talked to have been very supportive of the effort because harassment in the workplace is a, is a big issue and they want to prevent it. They don't know how to prevent it. So it can be harassment, um, you know, uh, harassment. So uh, lack of boundaries and borders between coworkers in terms of, you know, how do you define appropriate relations and appropriate behavior, but it could also be um, uh, your boss. And um, these women, they did something really amazing. They said, since we don't have a law, we're gonna work with women to help them come up with strategies for resistance, um, how they can resist and how they can create spaces in their workplace where they can bring this to the attention of management and make management responsive. Um, but it's, they're, doing, they're doing great work, yes. But we don't, we don't hear about those, those kinds of things. Yes, and wouldn't it be lovely if we could work together on these kinds of things, uh, women in the US and women there, and uh, focus on how we make all of our lives better instead of the way uh, it, it looks right now. And in the remaining minutes we have, maybe we should go back into the big picture. Uh, how much do you fear uh, that the U.S. policy will be successful in creating chaos uh, inside of Iran? What do you feel is the end game? And um, what do you think that we as Americans who want to uh, uh, help create more space for Iranians to change their own society, what can we do to be helpful? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am fearful about the future of Iran. Iran is a big country in the region. Its instability will not help the region. It won't help U.S. interests or European interests in the region. It won't help the security of the region. I'd like to see an Iran that's engaged both with its neighbors in a positive way, but also the international community. Iran has been isolated for 40 years. It's probably one of the most isolated countries. It hasn't, you know, and I think even despite its isolation, it has a strong civil society. We've tried not speaking, not talking. Um, I think it's time to sort of for full engagement. And when I talk about engagement, I don't just mean engagement of government and business. It should be engagement at all levels. So at a cultural level, academic level, civil society level, right, sports, etc. That's That's the future I see. That's what I would like to see. I think destabilization efforts will not serve anybody's interests. I hope that the Iranian government and the U.S. government take the notion of uh, negotiations and discussions um, seriously and move forward with it. No one can um, stand, you know, can, can uh, um, bear the consequences of a failed state 
such as Iran in the region, not I Iranians can't, you know, um, uh, withstand that level of, you know, destruction. The region can't either. And I don't think it would be good policy for the U.S. or for Europeans. So I hope that we can move past the stalemate to have constructive dialogue and discussion. Um, Wonderful. So as we close here, just to let our listeners know that uh, you and your colleagues in the Iranian American community have been working with us at Code Pink in lobbying our members of Congress to speak out against the sanctions and certainly push back against any kind of uh, military attacks on Iran. Uh, and we also are creating some exciting programs that you are helping us with in terms of these people to people ties. Uh, and so anybody who wants to get involved with us, please contact us. You can write to info at codepink.org uh, or go on the website, sign up for our uh, weekly alerts. But thank you so much, Susan, for the wonderful your work you're doing to uh, help try to keep and, and under these very difficult circumstances, expand the space for civil society inside Iran. And of course, uh, that means that we have to uh, stop the uh, attacks from the U.S. so that that kind of opening can flourish. Um, thank you for being on with us, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for all the great work that Code Pink is doing to support, you know, Iranians and to prevent war and, and, and sanctions. Great. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.